Say good morning to each of you. Welcome uh, to this important webinar focused on uh, trans children, youth, and families, and our church's ministry uh, with these persons. Um, I'm glad you all are here uh, to share and to learn, and I especially want to uh, extend a thank you here at the beginning uh, to Reverend Jeffrey Moore, Reverend Heather Goddess, uh, who will be our primary presenters and speakers today um, for their willingness to, to lend their expertise and experience with us uh, to bless us in our church's ministries. You may or may not know that uh, the uh, the inspiration and the the instigation maybe for um, putting together this learning opportunity um, came about at our North Texas Annual Conference in June. Uh, there was a resolution that was uh, resoundingly passed on the last day of annual conference focused on trans youth and families. And I'll read the um, the therefore, uh, part of the resolution uh, to be a kind of ground for our time together. So that resolution, um, as it was passed, <clears throat> ended by saying, therefore, be it now resolved that our churches in the North Texas Conference will be safe sanctuaries for trans children, youth, and their families. And further, while we acknowledge the obligation our clergy have as mandatory reporters, we do not, because of our convictions of faith, consider gender-affirming care child abuse and thus will not report it as such. So that was what uh, resolution stated. And uh, in the aftermath of that resolution, uh, there was conversation about the fact that um, it's one thing to um, encourage churches to be safe sanctuaries. It's another to uh, equip church leaders with information with about how to go about doing that. And so, uh, again, that is the real focus of our webinar uh, today, that kind of equipping. So there'll be some presentation, there'll be some opportunity for conversation and questions. Um, as we move along, feel free to drop your questions in the chat. Um, Keep in mind, please, uh, just norms of Zoom etiquette, if we can remain um, re remain muted throughout. And again, there'll be opportunity um, at different points for uh, dialogue, either in small group or to possibly um, pose a question. So again, thank you all for being here today. Um, and with that, uh, let me offer a prayer and then I will turn it over to, uh, to Jeffrey and Heather. So will you pray with me? Oh, good and gracious God, we give you thanks for the gift of this new day. We give you thanks for the breath of your spirit that enlivens each of us. And that means that each and every one of your creatures is sacred in your eyes. God, we remember as we gather um, the ministry of Jesus Christ and the way in which he moved freely and offered himself, his presence, his grace freely to all people, but especially those who were in his day and time marginalized or, um, or misunderstood or left out. God, we remember the way that he provided safe sanctuary for all those he encountered. And so God, we gather in that spirit, in his spirit, and we uh, come with open hearts, eager to listen, to understand, to learn. And we pray that what we gain here will strengthen our ability to offer a powerful witness to who you are in our places of ministry. So bless our time together. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. All right. Well, um, we are grateful that all of you are here today and um, that you took the time out of your day to uh, spend uh, with us learning more and um, 
growing uh, your resources for ministry. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and get us started. Um, you can control the size of your screen if you want to slide it back and forth. You want to be able to see more faces, things like that. You can you can do that. Um, and just kind of outline our time together. We recognize that all of you are on a different part of this journey and you have different amounts of knowledge. And so um, we tried to kind of make this as generic as possible. Uh, there will be some language. There will be some things that you may not necessarily be familiar with. So please feel free to pop in the chat if we use um, a word or a term that you don't know. Um, and we can, um, we'll try to catch those as they come through, but sometimes that happens. Um, but our time together will be what you see on the screen. So we'll start um, talking about myths and um, statistics. We'll go through some language um, and why language matters, um, some practical considerations, and then we will have breakout groups. So we are recording the, um, the informational part of this. Breakout groups will not be recorded. And then the conversations after breakout groups um, where we might share out some of our specific situations in uh, the church will not be recorded. So just so you know, for confidentiality um, and protection of our young people, we won't be recording those, but we do want this resource to be available. So um, we had to find a compromise. Um, and then of course, we'll share resources, contact information, and all of that good stuff. As Jeffrey mentioned at the beginning, uh, we just want you to put in the chat why you're here. What brought you here today? Um, you can put where you, you know, uh, what church you're affiliated with um, and what your role is, but also just what brings you here today? What was it about um, this webinar that, that made you want to attend? Speak, speak, speak. All right. So, um, and of course, um, I'll just ask again that you make sure that you're muted um, and that that way there's no competing um, sounds during the webinar. So we're gonna start out with myths. We're just gonna talk through it. Um, we will provide this PDF uh, for you. So don't feel like you need to write everything down. Um, or if I don't read everything on the uh, screen, you'll have access to it, I promise. Um, so there are some myths that we just wanna kind of go over with you um, just to start us out. So the first myth is that children are too young to know their gender. So our understanding of gender um, starts pretty early and anybody who um, knows somebody who is gender non-conforming or trans or non-binary in any way um, can think of examples early in life where they did not fit in what we would call the gender norm. So um, why do we, we know that cisgender, um, same gendered children who identify with the gender they were assigned at at birth um, know their gender very early. Why would we not assume the same about transgender or non-binary children? Second myth is that a person um, is only transgender if they declare it at a very young age. Um, as we know, gender is socially constructed in a way that gender is put on to us at a very young age. And so, especially in um, some generations, it takes a long time to unpack all of that. Um, and so there's a whole bunch of different ways and different times in life that somebody might um, find, uh, identify uh, and un unveil their identity as transgender. There are only two genders. Um, gender is a spectrum. It's not limited to just two possibilities. Uh, there's lots of research and information about that. We'll share some resources later for you. Um, many transgender children change their mind about their gender. So not all children who express themselves in gender expansive ways are transgender. Um, the reality is, is that as we all develop our identity, um, we all learn how to express our gender as we develop, um, and that takes well into our 20s. So um, many children, we can just drop transgender from that myth, children change their mind about their gender, they're figuring it out, they're learning their identity. It's not, it isn't a, um, a transitional thing always. And we might have time later to talk a little bit about um, how those changes of mind or, or um, 
detransitioning might happen, but that is a could be a whole other webinar. Um, being transgender or non-binary is a sign of mental illness. It's been many, many years since that has been the case. It's been out of the DSM for um, a long time as a mental illness. Um, there are a lot of stress factors that might manifest in mental illness, but being transgender or non-binary is not necessarily a sign um, of mental illness. Uh, transgender and non-binary people are doomed to live unhappy lives. Of course, it is true that transgender and non-binary youth are um, at higher risk. Um, we'll talk about the statistics a little bit um, in just a minute, but the reality is, is they're no more uh, at risk than anybody else, or no more uh, doomed to live unhappy lives than anybody else. They're just... Um, they're more at risk because of the way that the culture and society puts gender um, on, pushes gender on them. And so, um, of course, the last sentence of this is the most significant factor in a gender expansive young person's well being is the support of family um, and friends and church and church leaders. <clears throat> Transgender and non binary people of all ages can find love, create families, and live fulfilling lives. Okay, so I get to uh, talk about the fun part. Uh, I, I wanna go back to the la that sentence that um, Heather highlighted. The most significant factor in a gender expansive young person's well-being is the support of family. The converse of that is the most significant uh, factor in a um, gender non-conforming child's um, well-being is uh, or lack of well-being is the discrimination um, and ridicule and harm that they experience out in society. So <clears throat> we're not, I'm not going to read all these statistics to you. We're just going to go through them. I just want to, um, <clears throat> I need to talk louder. Okay, let's try that. <clears throat> there you go. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Um, I just want to highlight to you how vulnerable this community is. And um, <clears throat> you will remember from your UM doctrine course that you took uh, that the first general rule is, let's all say it together, do, do no, no harm. harm. Right? So as with any vulnerable population, our first goal is to do no harm. And this is a very vulnerable population. They, are, uh, they exist at the intersectionality of several um, <clears throat> forms of discrimination and uh, prejudice, and that puts them at uh, high risk for suicide. We can go on to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> depression. Um, sleeping, which we know all children need. Um, and uh, next slide. Um, even access to health care. It's hard to believe that someone would experience uh, discrimination and biases, prejudice in the healthcare system, but in fact they do. Um, they're subject uh, to a higher rate of homelessness, a high rate of police mistreatment, um, and harassment and bullying in school. So <clears throat> I imagine that a lot of us are here because we want to equip ourselves for those face-to-face -face conversations that we may have with a family or with a youth and how we can support them. We want to take just a minute to step back and talk more broadly about why language matters, because your advocacy is going to start not in the pastor's office, but at the front door and on your live stream and in your worship service, in your liturgy. Language is incredibly important. We all know it's a powerful tool. Um, it not only affects how you think, it shapes your reality. Your reality as an English speaker is shaped differently than the reality of a German speaker um, because of the language that you use. 
Um, <clears throat> language allows you to communicate what you think and feel, but to convey your very self, right? The way that you understand the world and yourself to others. Thoughtful language shows respect, acknowledgement, and acceptance. So how you navigate gendered language speaks volumes about the value you place on the identity of others. Using non-gendered, non-sexist language communicates that you're listening. And listening is one of the most important things for any population that feels unheard. Um, <clears throat> many of our uh, uh, BIPOC brothers and sisters and siblings have been trying, see I, there I just did it and had to correct myself, <laughs> um, have been trying to communicate this to us for years and generations. We do not feel heard. So you must, listening is important. Uh, it communicates that you care, that you value their experience. It demonstrates sensitivity and it's listener oriented rather than speaker oriented. <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> we wanna move beyond gendered language using words like people, person, individual, human, man, uh, humankind, humanity, rather than mankind. We don't man a booth, we staff a booth, for example. Um, <clears throat> interchange with woman and person equally. Um, here just, this is a long list of kind of things where uh, gender bias shows up. Um, I mean, it's, it's deep in our, in our language and you need to think about that. Go to the next slide, we invite you to think about it. Uh, again, I just said brothers and sisters a minute ago, and then I corrected myself to siblings. Um, <clears throat> but even simple questions like, who's your girlfriend or boyfriend? Um, again, you might think about this in terms of, uh, this is a rabbit hole, but young couples who may be silently struggling with infertility and you say, when are you gonna have children? They may be desperately trying to have children. Um, so the questions that we just assume in terms of cultural norms uh, have huge implications. Mm -hmm. um, and pronouns. This is a particularly important aspect for um, trans and non-binary kids. Here are some other um, things of, of the way that gendered language shows up in our uh, our language. Uh, again, brothers and sisters, um, kingdom, girls night, boys night, manly, girly. Um, well, we got brothers and sisters on there twice. Man that important. What? It's that important. <laughs> um, cry like a girl, uh, man up. But, uh, you know, other things like lame, dumb, bipolar, uh, any time we use that kind of a, a characteristic or a diagnosis as a derogatory or as a label, um, it reinforces this, um, uh, this whole structure. I handle scripture by editing it. Um, and so... If I can easily edit out brothers and sisters and just say siblings, um, then that's what I do. Often for the sake of poetry, because so, it, sometimes Paul has a rhythm, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. So I say, dear siblings and friends in Christ. Or if you wanna keep the familial, because friends is a little more distant, dear siblings and family in Christ. Da, 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 see? I've kept the rhythm of the thing, but I have taken the, the gender out of the language. So now Heather's gonna to talk to you about pronouns. Okay, so pronouns is, um, is one of those things that can be difficult to navigate, um, but the question is always like, why are they so important? And um, so common responses when we talk about pronouns is it's just too hard it's unnatural it's really not that big of a deal and it doesn't make sense grammatically and so we're going to address all of these things so it's really it's really not that hard 
Um, we easily learn to call newlywed people by their new last name. Uh, we use nicknames, uh, all sorts of different ways that we change how we refer to people. Um, and so language also evolves. Uh, this is an evolution of language. The way that we use pronouns is an evolution of language. They, as a plural, was actually a result of the Oxford movement. Prior to that, it was a singular. It was part of the the, thou, you know, that. Um, and so they is actually originally a, um, a singular. Um, so we're going back to the OG. Um, everything feels unnatural at first. Everything feels unnatural at first, but when it becomes normalized, when it becomes a part of language, a regular use, it becomes much easier. Um, we created language, so we have the power to change it. Um, oh. Go ahead. Think about um, how unnatural the language of I died and yet I am alive again sounded at the beginning. I mean, right? Mm -hmm. And yet the found that's the foundation of our faith. We take as the foundation of our faith a language claim that is unnatural. Um, so just to go over some of the common pronouns, of course, we all know um, she, her, he, him, uh, they, them, theirs is a, a common uh, use for gender neutral. Um, it's it can be used in the singular and it was actually apparently the word of the year in 2015 um z uh here and her are yes are other ways um they're called neo pronouns uh you might not ever hear them but you might hear them so we wanted to make sure that you saw them so you weren't totally like what is this um it's like here, it's pronounced like here and it replaces the uh, her, hers, him, his, they, their in a way of sort of pushing against all normal, uh, typical pronouns and, and offering a neo pronoun. And then there are some who prefer for you to just use their name um, and they prefer not to use any pronouns at all. And that that probably might be the most difficult for us to get used to in just repeating someone's name because we're it's drilled into our head not to do that in writing and things like that so um key important things for doing pronouns right if you make a mistake correct yourself and move on don't make a big deal um i actually need to update the slide i'm recognizing but just gently correct others without embarrassing the individual being misgendered. So just simply say, Noah, remember Kai uses they, them pronouns, um, and then just move on. Um, we do this a lot in, in, our, uh, in our house and in our, our family and our church. So uh, we have to be reminding ourselves often. It becomes more and more natural to go. So question we get often is, should I put my pronouns on my emails or my name tag or anything like that? Um, absolutely. You should absolutely feel confident and comfortable doing that. What that does is that communicates that you want to know other people's pronouns. So if you have um, on your name tag, your pronouns, then somebody might be willing to one, put their own pronouns on their name or let you know, hey, by the way, I use they, them pronouns. And then you just move on, you start doing that. Um, what about introductions? Uh, when you have a group of people and you're introducing, it's really easy to just say, okay, we're going to say our names, our pronouns, and what our favorite ice cream is, um, and go around and everybody does that. It makes it uh, so that it just takes the, the spotlight off of the person who um, might have a pronoun that either doesn't seem to match with how they present or how they've been known or what they're, you know, or is a they, them pronoun usage. And, um, you know, we won't know that otherwise. So if you take the initiative of making that a safe space for them to be able to um, share that, then they will step into that space. Okay. Um. I want to pause here and um, answer a question that's come up in the chat that I didn't see from Carrie. Um, 
uh, is it harmful to use brothers and sisters language in our liturgy? Um, I guess I might ask the question, uh, flip the question around and say, as a woman, is it harmful to refer to God as he? The answer might be no, as long as images are balanced. But if all I hear is God is he, every time God is mentioned for my entire life as a woman, it becomes harmful. Could. Mm -hmm. So um, brothers and sisters language um, doesn't need to be harmful as long as it's balanced in a constellation of language. Now, the more I would suggest to you that the more we could get towards non-gendered language for God, the better we're doing. So the more we can get towards non-gendered language in liturgy, um, <clears throat> the better we're doing. In the meantime, th there's a spectrum. And so often I will say at the beginning of my service, um, <clears throat> you may hear language in the service that is abrasive or um, uh, isolating to you. Um, for that, we apologize. We hope we've done the best to do uh, with our language to make it as inclusive as possible. And we hope that during the course of the service, you will hear language um, which also feels welcoming and affirming. So that, you know, I, I can't catch everything, right? But I'm, I'm, I'm hoping in the course of the uh, service to create a wide spectrum that welcomes and affirms everyone at some point. Because of course, there are people who identify as brother or sister. Um, uh, this is not, um, uh, a course, I mean, this is not a webinar on, <laughs> it's definitely not a course. This is not a webinar on um, the theology or biblical interpretation of gender. If people are interested in that, we would be happy to provide one of those. Um, <clears throat> but just some things to think about um, in terms of number of genders in the Bible, um, you might, uh, think about, and then let's have a discussion about people who like penguins and um, where penguins were uh, created in the, in the story of Genesis. Or you might consider why after God creates day and night, then it says, and there was evening and there was morning. Like, where did those fit in? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so some practical considerations. First of all, um, this is uh, being transgender or non-binary is not a matter of taking on an identity. It is a matter of revealing their true identity. And here I do want to share a short scripture passage from the sixth chapter of Mark. Jesus went to his hometown accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked. What's this wisdom that's been given to him? What are these remarkable miracles he's performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, John, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his own home. Jesus' identity in the culture was a carpenter. That was his identity. It wasn't his, it wasn't his vocation. It wasn't his job. It was his identity. Um, we have a hard time maybe connecting with this because we have become so... Um, <clears throat> promiscuous in our vocations and jobs in current culture, but I would encourage you to go back, take a field trip to um, Kentucky or West Virginia and ask people why, knowing that they are going into a, a mine full of coal dust that will shorten their lives, that they're still coal miners in 2022. And they will tell you it's because it's their identity. They know nothing else. 
their father was, their grandfather was, their great-great-grandfather was. This is who they are. Jesus was a carpenter in the culture. In, in appearing as the son of God, he did not take on a new identity. He rather revealed his true identity. So um, <clears throat> expressing emotions and asking for support doesn't equal weakness. Um, I mean, I, hopefully that's uh, self-apparent to most of us. Um, young people are often dismissed by adults. This is in <laughs> a lot of situations. Um, <clears throat> and, um, you know, wanting to be seen as a child of God in your true identity isn't a problem. Again, go back to the sixth chapter of Mark and the rest of the gospel. Um, and uh, uh, see what's going on there with Jesus. Um, as we've already seen with some of the um, uh, statistics, the risk of ignoring or not believing a student who's coming out is far outweighs any concerns about um, whether they might be seeking attention or whatever. Um, ignoring them, is not going to make it go away. Um, and you, please, please, if there's anything else you hear today, believe what your LGBTQ students tell you about themselves as they express and explore their identity. Remember, even Jesus explored his identity. Look at Luke. Um, and he grew in wisdom and stature. Right, Jesus grew into his identity as um, the fullness of what it means to be the Christ. Um, this is not your place for someone to educate you. I mean, your interaction with your trans youth and families is not your place to educate yourself about trans people. Just as your interactions with your BIPOC siblings is not your place to educate yourself about racism. That's your job to do here in this kind of environment. Um, they know their story. Please do not question it. Listen, 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 and affirm. This is their story. Believe me, even the youngest of youth and children who have um, come forward with whatever story they have, um, they have journeyed long and hard with this. Um, it's not just something that they dreamt up and, um, you know, came out. Uh, implying, wondering, questioning if this is a phase communicates you don't trust them, um, that queerness is chosen, um, and that they'll grow out of it. I would hide please implore you to avoid the language of choice or decision or lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, this is about identity, not a decision. Okay, so uh, one of the most common questions we get is, well, can I still have gendered activities? and like uh, boys versus girls skit nights or uh, small groups based on uh, gender or a girls spa night or a boys camping trip or things like that. Um, you know, we're not here to say, no, you can't do that. Um, but what we hope is that in having this conversation, you'll recognize that sometimes those things can be harmful um, and can cause harm as Jeffrey was talking about earlier, earlier with the general rules. Um, so whenever you think of an activity or a conversation that needs to be gendered, you need to ask yourself a few questions. Why do I think this? Why does this conversation need to be gendered? Does it really need to be gendered? Or is it just what we've always done? Um, and then the last question, which I think is one of the most important, is would everyone benefit from this information? A lot of times when I teach Wonderfully Made, um, people will ask, and I don't know, um, 
if this is true for you too, Cheryl, but I think that people will ask, well, can, can we do like a boys group and a girls group? And I always have to have this conversation with them is everyone benefits from this information. It is just as important um, for males assigned at birth to hear about what it means to be female um, and to go through the things that uh, female bodies go through as it is for female bodies to hear what male bodies go through. And so if you cannot gender something, um, everyone would benefit from this information. Boys also like pedicures. So um, pedicures are for everyone. Um, yes, so David put in the, the chat that at youth retreats and camp sleeping arrangements are either a boy or girl's cabin. Um, these are issues that we are currently talking about. Um, I know at least uh, we have had conversations at uh, midwinter retreats and such in the past where we've had non-binary students that have attended um, of how we do that. Um, there are camping ministries in the United Methodist Church that offer um, gender neutral cabins um, or gender inclusive cabins. And, and those, are, those, are, those are policies that churches need to be thinking about. When we're having a retreat, how do we do this? Um, we had a planning retreat um, last weekend and everyone was in the same room or not last week, I guess it was a couple of weekends ago now, but everyone was in the same room. Um, and, you know, we were, we had not, we didn't have a sea of lava, but, you know, they sort of self-selected where they were going to sleep, but they were supervised. So it was, it was fine. Um, so you have to figure out what is best for your particular group uh, in, in that particular situation. Um, you want to make sure that you create physical, spiritual, and emotional room for young people to be themselves as fully as possible when they are in your space. Um, you want to help families of LGBTQ youth through their teenagers coming out process um, and all of the ebbs and flows of that. Um, you want to make sure that you listen to parents' concerns and questions about what the new identity means. Parents go through a grieving process. Um, you are going to be their pastor through that experience. Um, they grieve all sorts of things. And in, in many ways, it is it can be like a death. And so um, you would approach that in the same way you would approach any other grieving process. And of course, throughout the entire thing, um, as we've said several times, just encourage them to love and support their child, even if it means shielding the children, the teen, um, from some relational fallout that might come, which may include family members. So um, having those real conversations with parents um, is important because there are going to be family members who are not, um, who don't respond well. Um, so how should I respond when a child or student comes out? So recognize the courage that it takes to come out. Make sure that you celebrate that with them. Celebrate the moment. Um, don't editorialize. Don't say, I always knew. <laughs> I always had a suspicion. Don't say that. Um, don't, don't make it about you, right? This is about them. Realize that this is just one step. This is a step in a journey that is, um, is a journey everyone, if everyone takes at some level, right? Like we all figure out who we are. We all figure out how we are gonna express ourselves as humans, um, as sexual beings. And so this is just a step in a journey that, that all humans go through in some way. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's a step that is, it's made a big deal in our culture. Um, and make sure that you establish expectations of confidentiality. That they know that you're not gonna tell anybody that they don't want to know. Like if they come to you and say, please don't tell my parents, please don't tell my dad, please don't tell my mom, you know, please don't tell my grandparents um, and, um, and doing that. So, um, there's a, so there's a question about talking about restroom facilities, bathrooms. Um, if you have a way to make a restroom a gender neutral restroom, um, that's great. Uh, you should definitely do that. Um, if you have a single stall restroom, that's even better. 
um, but it's, it, it is always great to be able to make a, a bathroom space um, a safe space for students. And at some of the camps that we, that Jeffrey and I have worked at, we have restrooms that uh, we make single stall restrooms. They actually have two stalls, but they have locks on the door. So during the week when we're at camp, we make them single stall and anyone can use them. Um, so that that's really the easiest way. But I think that in our churches, if, if, if you have a restroom that can be designated as a, a family restroom or an all gender restroom, that's great. Um, there are places where you can order signs that will say all gender. Um, and you have different, you know, little people on them. Um, if you're not ready to have this conversation, you need to get ready <laughs> because you're going to have it um, and push yourself to get into this uncomfortable territory um, because it's really important as in, in what we do as clergy, as lay people in the church who are journeying along people, uh, along with people, um, it is our job to be in uncomfortable territory. And so um, we just need to be ready to do that. Remember that this is not about you and your understanding and your education. This is about um, the person's identity and figuring out how to live and thrive and flourish as a created being of God. Um, if, you're, if you really feel that you're not confident about having the conversation, just remember to always respond with affirmation, acceptance, and an expression of God's love. God loves you. Exactly as you are, God loves you. Um, you are a culture creator. You get to create the culture at your church, um, your staff along at your leadership. Um, they, you all have a part to play in how the culture is created, the church, the games that are played, uh, curriculum that's used, the jokes that are made um, and laughed at, the way you talk about God, the language you use, um, even the kinds of events you plan. And you all have a spidey sense about the culture at your church. Turn That is turned up to 11, 12, 15 for folks who have been traditionally uh, pushed to the margins of the church. Um, and so listen to them, listen to uh, the queer people in your church, listen to your queer friends, um, do an audit of your physical space. Do you have a family restroom? I know Jessica um, talked about um, having that once the family restroom was created with a single stall, it was really a way to, of communicating that love and um, and acceptance. Uh, make sure that you're looking at what messages are being communicated in art, posters, bulletin boards, signage. And this is the same work we do when it comes to racism and um, diversity and inclusion, right? So this is all, it's all intersectional. Um, is it homogenous? Are we seeing only cisgender heteronormative families? And then of course, make small changes first. You don't have to do anything crazy. You don't have to build a new bathroom. Little steps are okay. Um, okay, so we're going to go into breakout groups. I'm just going to, um, we've got breakout groups set up. We've got some people who to lead the breakout groups. Um, so these questions, I I'm, have them on a document that I'm actually going to drop in the chat so you all can open them if you want to use them for um, a guide because I know they won't be in the chat once you get into your break room. Um, so there are the questions for discussion. So um, we're going to break you into groups and give you an opportunity to talk about specific things that you have going on in your congregation, questions that you have, um, or things like that. And um, so you can use these questions here or um, in the next um, uh, slide uh, to kind of guide your conversation if you don't know what else to talk about. Um, Jeffrey, do you have anything to add? Um, I would just add these are um, there is someone in your group who has been invited to help facilitate the conversation that certainly doesn't mean that they're experts we're all on a journey um, we're all learning and humility about this topic is <laughs> one of the best uh, qualifications um, but it, this is a place also if you have contextualized questions um, you know, what if, or I have this or whatever, um, this would be a place to bring those up because we can't obviously 
address all those in the large group. So um, uh, we'll spend 15 minutes, maybe, yeah, 15 minutes in breakout groups and come back at 11.30. All right, very good. I'm gonna um, manually finish setting these up. So just give me a minute or two and we'll all find our way into those groups. So while Andy, while you're finishing that, I'll go ahead and just kind of walk through some of these questions. Um, so you might think about how gendered language, how you how gendered language is used in your congregation, or someplace that you'd like to change it. Um, if you had to grade your church and their use of gendered language, this is always interesting to sort of see. Um, and then just think about a couple places that you might want to start to change that language. Um, and then you can use these, um, of course, this work is intersectional, right? Like I said a couple minutes ago, you might ask a question of how many um, queer folk are in lay leadership in our church? How many um, queer clergy are, um, you know, ever come to the church or exposed or is our congregation exposed to? Um, so you can ask some of these questions and talk about ways that you might see a possibility of increasing um, a congregation's exposure um, and and start to shift the culture and um, in your congregation. Andrew, I'll see if I can find a, a link for you. I'm trying to remember who we ordered ours from at Oak Lawn, but. And to be clear, um, the word queer is a word that the community uh, has reclaimed um, in in our generation that when we grew up queer was um, derogatory. Um, it is now a broad umbrella term to um, it's often used as a broad umbrella term to re to refer to uh, basically kind of the entire alphabet soup. Um, so <laughs> it's not derogatory when we say queer people. We're talking about L, G, B, T, Q, which can also mean queer or questioning, um, et cetera, et cetera. And it looks like our groups are ready. So All let's right. go. Oh, here we go. Okay, are we all back? Awesome. All right. Um, <clears throat> Okay, we want to have some time for some open Q&A, but I also want to honor that people may need to move on. And so we want to share some resources with you um, quickly. And so I'm going to share my screen. Um, this is a new uh, web page that's on the uh, conference website. You can go to, just go to ntcumc.org and uh, in the uh, search, put trans, and it will. This will be the first thing that pops up. Um, or you can uh, you can go bookmark this address. Um, but here are some links directly to our website, which uh, have some more detailed information. Um, this was a seminar that we did earlier this fall. I mean spring. I don't know what time of year it is. Um, uh, when the governor and the um, AG were hot and heavy about um, criminalizing uh, gender affirming care. I do want to say, even though it seems like this has gone quiet, um, it's not gone away. They're busy campaigning right now, for sure, but, and they're going to come back to this. Um, so this is some good information about how to get started in terms of protecting your children, how to build a safe folder. It explains what a safe folder is and then some resources. There's lots of good information on there for what to do in terms of um, a CPS investigation, um, how to respond when CPS shows up, 
et cetera, et cetera. Um, and to be clear, I think I said this on the conference floor, the trauma to a family that has nothing to do with whether it's legal or criminal. CPS can embed an open investigation on any complaint they receive. And that's where the trauma comes to a family is at the point of investigation, not at the point of trial. So <clears throat> if I call CPS and I say, hey, I think the person living at the bishop's address is looking at child pornography, they can open an investigation based on that. And they can start asking the bishop's neighbors, hey, have you seen anything, right? And now the cat's out of the bag, even though the accusation was totally false. Let's be clear, it's totally false. Um, and it has, has no grounds in reality and it's not legal, but they can open an investigation. So you can see how that happens. Um, then here are some uh, resources that I think would be directly helpful to you. I mean, like basic uh, nuts and bolts tools uh, that I pulled from the PFLAG website. Um, PFLAG is parents and families of lesbian and gay. It's, a, it's an organization that was started in the 70s. It's much broader now. There's a PFLAG chapter at North Haven that North Haven hosts. We're getting ready to launch another PFLAG chapter for the Eastern exurbs and suburbs at St. Stephen. And um, I think uh, Grace Avenue is talking about launching one for the Northern counties. Um, so PFLAG has a huge amount of resources on their website, but these are some ones that I think would be immediately helpful to you. And then um, here are two other uh, documents. These are PDFs talking about suicide and LGBTQ populations and um, from another great website, Straight for Equality, uh, a PDF on trans ally materials. So all um, of available to you on the conference website. Two resources that I think every pastor should have, every person who works in a church, every, if you have conversations with young people, um, these resources you should have. Um, it's welcoming and affirming. Um, it is a guide to supporting um, and working with LGBTQ Christian youth. Um, it's edited by Lee Fink. I will make sure that we send a link to this uh, to all of you. It has an accompanying um, youth book that's queerfully and wonderfully made. Um, it's a great, those are great resources, but this one is especially good um, for a lot of these questions that you have and things that we talked about today, it'll be repeated in this. Um, a resource for parents that I really love is the Gender Identity Guide for Parents. Um, again, it's compassionate advice to help your child be their most authentic self. Um, it just sort of helps kind of walk through this journey. Um, there are others, so we'll make sure that we send um, those to you. I know that um, Marianne uh, posted a document and then there was another, oh, uh, in flesh. Jessica talked about in fleshed as a great resource. You can Google um, in fleshed um, liturgy resource, inclusive language. It'll, it'll, but I'll, I'll pull all those links and make sure that um, they get sent out in the email with the PDF of the, um, the PowerPoint. Um, and then, of course, Jeffrey and I are both resources. Um, if you need help, um, having these conversations. If you want somebody else to come in and have the conversation and facilitate the conversation so that you don't have to be the person, um, sometimes that's easier. Um, we are absolutely willing to do that and we'll put our emails in the chat as well. Um, and so we can go into the Q&A. If there are questions, if you wanna ask a question, it might be good maybe um, to drop them in the chat uh, or you can, there's a lot of people. That's why I'm just concerned about like everybody unmuting and asking questions at once. Cause I know everyone's gonna ask questions. Um, while you're doing that, uh, I, uh, let me add, 
I use Enfleshed as a, ref as a reference and a resource often. It's also important to note that they come from a Calvinist background, not a Wesleyan background. So as you grab things from there, um, please be theologically aware of what's happening liturgically and that you may need to adjust some language to be more Wesleyan than Calvinist. There are email addresses. Unless, of course, you're a closet Calvinist. Then we need to have another conversation. But. Theology, humor. Always. No right. questions? Any questions? Wow. This is the most successful webinar I've ever led. Wow. Well. Well, okay. we appreciate all of your time um, and willingness to step into this conversation. Mm. Yes, Anne. Um, it is very important for youth ministers and pastors to not be silent. Um, again, if you have questions, um, you may email us, you can reach out to us in whatever way. Um, yeah, Laura, to your point, be aware of what's going on in your community, what your school board is doing, um, and be ready to speak out and, um, and step into that space in that uncomfortable space that we talked about. Um, thank you all. It was wonderful. And we look forward to seeing you again in another context or another conversation.